from the STEM Global Action Studios in New Orleans. This is the Let's Talk STEM with SGA's Dr. Calvin Mackey podcast. STEM Global Action is a national leader in creating STEM-based learning activities and delivering them virtually and in communities around the globe to students grades K through 12. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk STEM with Dr. Calvin Mackey. In today's episode, we'll bring you yet another informative conversation about STEM education and careers and highlight some of the key leaders in the field. But before we get started, as always, let's introduce our host and fearless leader, Dr. Calvin Mackey. Thank you, Ken. It's great to be here today. Man, I'm usually excited about these conversations, but today I'm ready to jump out of my seat. I can't <laughs> wait for you to introduce our special guest today. Well, how about I give you the honors? Uh, Ken, today we have with us Jan Morrison, the founder and CEO of TIES Teaching Institute, uh, Teaching Institute for Excellence in STEM. What the world needs to know is that we cannot talk about STEM education without the name Jim, Jan Morrison coming up. I mean, we reconnected about six years ago, but I've studied her work and watched her and listened listen to her for over the years. They would not be a STEM NOLA. They would not be a STEM Global Action without the work of Jan Morrison. So I want to introduce to everyone my friend, Jan Morris. Uh, Calvin, thank you so much, but that is just over the top. I have to tell you, you know, when people ask me, how do I want to introduce myself? I've gotten to the point now where you got enough years behind you that you have to pick it and focus it. And what I say is that I'm a teacher. That's what I do. I came into the world in 35 years in STEM in the classroom. And I think what I do is, and what I love, is when it involves that kind of environment. And that's not really any different than what you are, too. As an engineer, though, but you've chosen that path not just to tinker it and innovate it, but to make sure everybody understands it. Yeah, Jane, you're a teacher, but you're a teacher's teacher. I never forget, I asked my mom once. My mom said, what you want to be, son? I said, I want to be a teacher. My mom said, well, son, teach the world a better way. And you started in a classroom, Jan, but now you, you're helping uh, other teachers teach the world a better way. Tell us about ties and all of the work that you have done through your organization. Sure. Um, so at 20 years, ties is 20 years this year, 2022. Wow. Um, 20 years ago, I was I got a knock on the door, basically, and some collaboration from Open Society um, in Baltimore that said, look, what you're doing in the summer with Baltimore and their teachers and, and STEM was a new acronym. Um, they were, they said, you know, maybe you should think about starting a company. So at that point I said, companies, I do schools, I do organizations, but they helped. And we founded it. And not sh shortly after find founding ties in Baltimore, the Gates foundation got themselves organized, knocked on the door and said, what do you know about schools? What do you know about engineering the idea of teaching and learning and bringing the, the technology and engineering to all children, particularly those who didn't have, a, 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 have opportunity? And Ties was born. And Ties has always been the same. Calvin, it's always been like you, so you always talk about. It's helping children to make sense of the world. Yeah. They, they don't get a choice where they live. They are born into it, but that doesn't mean they can't grab it and shake it. And that those of us around it can't engineer communities, engineer new schools, create and design ecosystems to have infrastructures and enable our own groups, our own organizations, our own companies to, to do the work that's needed to for them to seek their own futures. And that's what ties is. And we have stayed the course. We've had enormous um, good partners and you and your and and the broader community that you live in has from the beginning been our, our dear love and our hope for all children. Great. And that's why I wanted you on here today, Jane, because you talked about the broader community, right? When yep. people hit, start talking about STEM and start talking about education, a lot of times you go straight to the schoolhouse door uh, and you started off saying you're a teacher and you're a teacher, I'm a teacher. But, you know, STEM NOLA, our biggest concern is connecting the classroom and the school to the broader to the broader community. And I believe about five years ago, I was walking through the Marriott Marquis Hotel in uh, Washington, D.C. Right. And I kept seeing these signs saying STEM ecosystem. And I wasn't even there for a STEM ecosystem meeting. 
And two days later, I bumped into my friend, Dr. Gregory Washington, who's now the president of George Mason. And he said, I was in DC at the STEM ecosystems. And I'm like, how can you be at a STEM meeting? And I'm not at the STEM meeting. And that's how I came to be introduced to STEM ecosystems. And then uh, for a year after that, you invited STEM NOLA to become one of your communities of practice yes. in the STEM learning ecosystem. So talk about uh, the STEM learning ecosystem and what it's doing across now, not only America, but the globe. Yeah, it's really important. Thanks so much. And I love it. I, I have still have this, this image of you there in that in the <laughs> hotel um, and Greg also. It's just a wonderful time and continues to be. So what we've got in STEM um, in our country, in the globe, are tons and stacks of programming. And what it became evident really fast is that the programs were not being effective as they could be um, because there wasn't an infrastructure to grab it, to leverage it, to support it, to love it, to make sure that the children and the families and the communities were connected, to make sure business and industry was connected and to act in a way that energy would go through the community to actually raise that ability of, of for everybody to understand what it was gonna take to create STEM jobs and opportunity. That's an ecosystem. So what we did is to leverage everything that was out there, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, statewide STEM networks, the Noyce Mott After School Networks, and so on and so on, and bring them in and look at them. What is it about them that worked? And what we found over and over was the ability to operate as an ecosystem in which all the constituencies understood that it took what it took to actually do STEM for kids, but not only kids, for companies, for nonprofits, for, for the mayor's office. And everybody had a role in it, a voice in it, about a responsibility. And that's when we shifted to the ecosystem model. Initially, 27 joined the group. And from there, right now, um, it is in America. We have 94 in America. And then we globally, we have Kenya, Ca uh, we have Canada, Mexico, and 10 ecosystems in Israel growing. Right, because so, I need to, I, I think I need to go visit the, those 10 ecosystems in Israel. So we need I to promised you, I think I promised you that. Uh, hey, now we got it on tape. I need to get that on tape. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it because it's really interesting to watch. They are the next generation. What did you learn in America? What did you learn in Mexico and around? How do we then supply, you know, really apply that to, to Israel with an Israeli context, with what they're trying to do with their, their children in the poorest of communities? And Israel has got a lot of that um, and is paying attention to it. And so with some very similar um, kinds of problems, but a different culture. Great. Now, Jen, I, I want to go in a different way, right? Because I can easily sure. jump in and we could talk about STEM skills, but I'm going to sit that on the side for a moment. Sure. Because what I really want to talk about, I had a, a, a known from the Pear Institute and I exchanged an a email recently and you introduced me to the Pear Institute. And, you know, when I joined the STEM ecosystems, I was, I was so happy to learn about your focus on social emotional learning, right. uh, looking at the whole kid. And with COVID, you know, everybody could talk about STEM, but really we need to talk about the social emotional learning. Can you talk, tell us more about how the STEM ecosystems and even a role that social emotional learning uh, plays in STEM and should play in STEM from an education standpoint? Sure, from the beginning, Calvin, we've always talked as you talk about the whole child, about the child as a family member, as a part of a school community, as a part of a, a working community, because so many of our children work and then the adults around them. And what we have from the beginning said in STEM is it is not a matter of just the technology and the tools and the mechanistic side of STEM. STEM is about problem solving. If you bring a human being to problem solving, you're immediately talking about social emotional learning. You whether the problems are their own, they're their community's problems, whether they seem petty or they're, they're astronomical because the whole world is suffering them, the reality is solving a problem is, is, is the heart of STEM. So it's absolutely a natural match to bring in the whole research community and practice community of social emotional learning. What Gil Nome has done so well at CARE is to figure that out. From the beginning, he said, STEM is not a 
an isolation or a silo from SEL. It is inextricably linked. So the beautiful thing is the instruments, the opportunities for people to speak in a way that they understand how to deal with emotion, how to deal with that kind of learning, given a COVID environment, given given a, a, a tragedy that happens in a community, given the fact that a family has a tragedy, or given the fact that it's, it's just the way life is for that family or their community without the tragedy. Everybody needs strength to be able to solve problems. You know, and, I, and I'm, oh, you, you, you spoke to me there because a lot of people don't know. You know, I went to Morehouse College mm -hmm. and I keep telling people, you know, we're human beings before we're hum, human doers. And the one thing Morehouse dealt with me, I wasn't dealing, struggling with the STEM. It was my being, right? My social emotional. Right. Uh, stuff and morals help me. I keep telling people morals help me to be, and if we can help more kids to be, yeah. then they're in a position to do. Right. And I really wanted to bring that up because I know a lot of educators are listening to us, and a lot of administrators are listening to us, and we put so much emphasis on the mechanization and the labs and making sure the kids can do. But it is you know STEM ecosystems have made it a point uh, that we deal with the being not only of the kid but of the family and of the community. So thank you for that. Jan, I'm just curious, when you're talking about skills, you know, what's, is there a practicality for STEM skills in the future, particularly when we start thinking about a post-COVID world and society yeah. and jobs and paths? What, what, where do you see those pathways and what are we missing? What, are, what is the average person missing when they think about what the, what a post-COVID world will look like? Well, I think, Thanks, Ken. It's a really good question. And it's, it's something that we have to all consider and ponder a little bit and not be reactive. A lot right at the moment, I think we're highly reactive as a group globally, um, and maybe even in things that we should be a little faster, a little slower, whatever. But the fact is that there's some things, there's some guideposts for us. The first guidepost I would say to you on skills is that um, skills are a natural cognitive. Gay development. Um, what, a little, a little one in our houses, Calvin. Whether it's in your house, in my, in my grand, as my grandchildren, whatever. When they're two, we expect certain things that they can do, and that we we foster that by we read with them, we give them manipulatives to play with, we take them to the playground. We know that's good for them, and we know that we say, oh, that's a good thing to do for a two-year-old. They enjoy it, they love it. But in the back of our mind, we know that we're building something. What we're building is an entire lifetime of ability, of skills at the time when they're developed. When you talk a four-year-old, you want a four-year-old to cross their midline. In poverty, in homes of poverty, in, in COVID, children are less likely to do that. Well, when they hit my physics class, they're gonna have a real problem. I had coordination and all of those, those good things that should be a natural for 17 year olds gonna be a problem. So when we're talking about skills, we've gotta talk about ages, We've got to talk about the ability for the kids in the proper time to have the proper kind of exposure and for it to spiral for the trajectory. It doesn't stop here. It doesn't become episodic. It grows. But I want to bring in two points. The thing that most worries me about COVID is the kids ability and time to play, to tinker, to have unguided, not two dimensional screens, but not playing games, but actually working on something that they build in which they go from nothing to something. But it's play. It's real play. There is real power in play. Let's not forget that as a skill. But the second thing is, and when you bring up Morehouse, it makes me think this all the time, is creativity. You know, that innovation is because those little ones sit and think, well, what if? You know, what if I tried this? You know, and at four years old, at eight years old, they're asking why. The skill that we have as adults is to foster that. That will be the foundation for critical thinking, for, the, for, all the, for all the skills that we list as those 21st century skills, for the ability to ask good questions, to inquire. All of that has to start, and we have to be mindful of that. Yep. But Jane... You said something there and you said when a kid, when a baby is two weeks old, we have certain expectations of development. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to spell it out because you and I both know that STEM and STEM development and STEM yeah. training has to be cradle to 
career. No question. It's absolutely amazing no that you went to the playing part, right? Yeah. We're having too many conversations about what are the kids missing in school, which they are missing, without having a conversation about what is it that they can be doing to supplement right. what they're missing from a theoretical standpoint to Absolutely. supplement. And I think you're 100% right. And we forget that we talk about school as an institution, a square room where they walk into and they say hi to their teachers. That's all fine. But your point is so well taken. What can we do? The great outdoors. What does out, being out of doors in New Orleans allow for you? It's an amazing opportunity for kids. It's if you get them out there to be able to do that. What does activity look like? It isn't just dribbling a basketball. Dribbling a basketball is a STEM activity as much as it is a sport, um, if, if you choose to look at it that way. So your point is it, absolutely, it's looking at the glass half full. What do we have that we should be, we should be able to do with them and provide for them, not what they have missed. I have to tell you, la, at the end of the first winter, that school year, last year, and we started to talk about learning loss, Calvin, I, I, I lost it. I, I couldn't handle it. I, I kept saying, I, it isn't, those children didn't, didn't just stop being that whole year. They didn't have a learning loss. It may have been different, but they gained. They learned and learned and learned all kinds of things. Now, what do we know as adults that they did? What kind of STEM foundations did they lay that we have no idea because we never asked? We just assume they lost. You know, yes, they took math tests and it doesn't look the same. But did you ask the right math question? Because maybe the math that they were doing had to do with 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 all kinds of fractions and cutting pizza up, you know, and doing things that were more tactical and practical and, practic and, and, and practical. So I think that the, I think you're so it's such an important piece. What, what are the plans at ties and particularly with STEM ecosystems to ensure racial diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that we achieve this within the STEM community? Well, so um, that is the, the question of the moment, and it should have been the question of the, of the decade and of the century, frankly, um, because opportunities have been lost. It is, we, we, at the ecosystem at Ties, we refer to equity, opportunity, and access. Um, and I'm less inclined to use checklists and to talk about, you know, what have we done? What have we not done? It is much more, number one, a shift in culture. Um, the culture has supported STEM being white and being racially biased. And if we don't say that out loud, then we are um, lying to ourselves. So those of us who've got this color hair and have been around, um, we have not necessarily done what we might have done to, to change that situation. We are part of the problem, not necessarily part of the solution. So that has to stop. Time out. Has to stop. The, the question is, how do we, how is that community deepened? And how do we understand the cultural nature that has to be there? And it doesn't come from just having just in enabling the ecosystems to hire more um, diversity. Certainly that's an at least, but it comes from also listening and operating differently and asking different sets of questions. So that's what the ecosystems are doing. They're asking what, what do they need to do together? They are in a community of practice, being together, they are asking each other, what is working? Where do you see the indicators of what is working? And where does the research support that? Where does the ethnography support it? Where does culture come in and the study of culture? Because that has to be part of it also. And what we have said is that this is not an overnight problem. It's not a situation that we got to overnight. It's not going to take us overnight and think that we can pat ourselves on the back, that we did a great job and we're there. We have to set situations up in order to be there. But I have to say, um, we all have to be involved in this and not just relegate this to the, the communities of color, to the underserved. Um, it is everybody's issue and it is not going away. That's the other thing I, I worry about. I've been in this long enough to watch Sputnik come and go, 
I was the child of the 60s. I was in those that that those curricula. Those were not a supportive curricula of diversity whatsoever. Um, and so sometimes when we say, well, can't in STEM, can we re relive our Sputnik era? That era, that would be the last thing I'd want to do, right? Let's not do that. You know, so those are things that we have to remind ourselves and have a little bit of the archive of what didn't work so that we're not deigned to repeat the mistakes. So it's an ongoing thing. You have to pay attention to it. It's, but I also want to say, this is not work. This ought to be a joy. Finally, we're at the point of the kinds of conversations we should be having and work that we should be doing. That should be a joy, not work. Now, now Jan, we almost getting to the end and you almost made it without using a $10 word. I mean, yeah, I want my $10, you. What's okay. that word she used? Et, et, etnography. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just- Study of culture. <laughs> Study of culture. And look, <laughs> And my hair is becoming more blind and more gray every day. So, <laughs> you know, uh, but 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 that's why you're my friend, because you, you, you say that part out loud and we got to say it out loud before we have action. And I'm honored to work with you towards putting that action uh, in place. And I think you and I complement each other so much because of your education background and because of my engineering background. And we see the world uh, so similar through the lens uh, for everybody, you know, with, with COVID. What it has done for STEM, all of the stuff you talked about in terms of the kids and engaging the kids and having them do things, we realized what we had to offer the world. We've been down here doing these kits because as an engineer, I was raising two sons and I'm like, my son should be working with their hands. Right. But once COVID hit, the rest of the world said, we want those kits too, Mackie. So we've shipped yeah. kits to 47 states and five countries. Fabulous. And one thing, another thing we noticed by doing what we are doing, and I'm jumping up on Zoom every day, teaching kids all around the world. Parents start writing in and said, thank you, you know, yeah. because they kids got to see somebody different. We start right. putting uh, women college students up in uh, black and brown and Hispanic uh, college interns on Zoom teaching kids. And the parents are so grateful for us uh, embracing everybody, right? I right. mean, from all ethnicities, right. it was like, thank you, this is amazing. My kids are getting to interact with real scientists from different backgrounds. Right. So STEM ecosystems, you know, you know it, but we want the world to know that is what we're going to bring to the world. That is what you have put together. And that is the solution uh, that's going to take us in a, you know, into, the, into the next century. So before we go, I want to say thank you. Uh, because sometimes a lot of people don't say that. And you have been out here doing the hard work. Uh, and STEM is, is, it's not easy, right? We have fun yeah. doing it, but... Right. We're here today because we want the rest of the world to know this is absolutely, absolutely fun. Right. It is. And, and the relationships you build are lifelong. And, and you know, I'm a test, I am can attest to that. I would also want to say, too, that the, the industries, the workforce, the future jobs and professions for our children right now are so interesting and so exciting and will offer them a lifetime of work that they will enjoy thoroughly. What we have to make sure is that they're ready to do that, that they can grab it on their own terms and that they can make the kind of, of, of funds and be gainful in a way that they can raise their families, they can enjoy the world, and then they can do what you've done, what I've done. We've turned to our children and said, you should be working with your hands. You should be thinking about this a different way and engaging with their own children. And that's the future. That's the, that's the legacy. And it's also the imperative uh, for what STEM is for the now what's going to be its third decade. Jan, thank you so much for joining us. I can see why you and Calvin are bosom buddies. You guys, are, you, are, you are truly two peas in a pod. But uh, thank you so much. But just, I, 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 must, I must admit, I, I, I'm struck by your positivity. Like you mm -hmm. tell it how it is, but always from a positive, yep. from a positive frame. So I think yep. that's really, really good. So thank you so much for joining us today and uh, come on back whenever you want. Well, I'd love to, and always with Calvin and with what you're doing and the, uh, the it's just, it's, it's, you know, we didn't say it out loud, but it's God's work and it is, 
and um, and it has to be kept that way. And um, and we also know that the that the work relies on us telling the way it is. So Calvin, thanks so much. It's always a delight. It's such a treat. Thank you, Jan. Thank you uh, for coming on. I'm looking forward to when we do it again. But more importantly, I'm looking forward to when we get together in person again. And promise me that's going to be real soon. As yeah. soon as we get beyond this last, this last, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, <laughs> COVID spike. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Great. Thank I will you. Take on it. Thanks. You've been listening to a STEM Global Action Podcast. Through our STEM-based programming, we put students on a path towards quality jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math. Visit us at www.stemglobalaction.com. Until next time, let's keep talking STEM.